comic weekly man, the jolly comic weekly man, and I'm here to read the funnies to you happy boys and honeys. Yes, boys and girls, it's comic weekly time, and here I come right into your house to bring a little fun and happiness, right out of the pages of Puck the Comic Weekly, straight into your living room, your friend, the comic weekly man, the jolly comic weekly man. Hello. Well, little Miss Honey, how are you today? I'm just fine, thank you. How are you? I'm just fine, too, thank you. Are you getting along in school since your Christmas vacation? Oh, really quite well, thank you. You getting a good mark in your history? Yes, quite good, thank you. Very well, let me test you. On what? What famous American will have a birthday this week? Um, what's the date? February 12th. Oh, oh, I know, because in our art class we made some cutouts of him. Oh, you did? Yes, yes, see if you can guess. Uh, is that a man with a beard? Yes, yes, it is, you're right. Yes, Abraham Lincoln. Uh, good for you, you're excellent in your history. Yes, I am, am I? And I think you should get a reward. Well, will you please read me the funny? Puck the comic weekly? Very well, I'll read that in just a moment. But before I do, let's listen to this nice man. <laughs> Now, here we go with Puck the Comic Weekly. And on the first page, under Bringing Up Father, Beetle Bailey. Magic words for the music, please. Very well, my lady. (whistles) Toot me a toot and tweet me a tweedle. Squeeze out music for Bailey the Beetle. (laughs) Today, one of the officers is talking to Beetle Sergeant. Hey, Sarge, I, uh, I think you're being too tough on the men. They might rebel. The sergeant replies... Ah, phooey. They're better off working and carousing around town. A short distance away, Beetle and his pals are sweating their brains out, digging a ditch. A little dog keeps pestering him. One of the soldiers says, Hey, scram, pooch. Sarge has a law against playing. But instead of scramming, the dog grabs the fellow's cap. And away he goes. Hey, hey, he's got my cap. And Beetle and his pals go after the dog. The dog runs around a building. Around the corner of the shack comes Beetle. Straight toward the sergeant he goes. Hey, there he is. Get him. I'll break his neck. The sergeant thinks they're coming at him. His cap pops off. And away he runs. First picture bottom roll. With the dog behind him. And the soldiers behind the dog. Tackle that dog. We're going to string you up. The sergeant doubles his speed and yells, Hey, stop, stop! Furloughs for everyone! One of the soldiers yells, Come here, you mangy flea-bitten cur! The sergeant shouts, Yeah, yeah, I did it. I've been a heel. I'll change. I'll fight. Hey, they passed me. And he sees Beetle grabbing the pup and the other soldiers gather around him. The sergeant says, Hey, you were chasing that dog? And Beetle thinks he's going to get into trouble again. Hey, don't be sore, Sarge. We'll get back to work. Last picture, the sergeant mops his brow in relief and answers, uh, No, no, no. Uh, take the afternoon off. <laughs> uh, you've been working too hard. And Beetle says, If I didn't know better, I'd say he's been working too hard. <laughs> The sergeant thought the men were mad at him for making them work so hard and were chasing him. Yes, and everything that they yelled at the dog, (laughs) the sergeant thought they were saying to him. Yes, wasn't that funny? Yes, it just goes to prove that when your conscience is bothering you, you think things are meant for you that aren't meant for you at all. Yes, that's so true. Yes, it's so true. Well, now I'll bet you you'd like to find out whether Flash Gordon... Oh, yes, I would, because Flash is in danger, but he doesn't know it. Very well, then, let's turn over the page... Go past the Deliodine and Prince Valiant. Turn over to page four. And there's Flash Gordon. And now we can find out what will happen. Yes, now we'll find out. You remember last week, Flash was on the planet Venus, where he'd overcome the tyrant, King Stang. And instead of putting King Stang in jail, Flash let him go free, but had put a guard to watch him. Yes, and Stang bribed the guard to deliver a message to Stang's friends. And the message told Stang's friends to overpower Flash at a certain special big important meeting. And I'm worried because Flash doesn't know anything about this. Well, let's read now and find out what happens. Here we go with Flash Gordon. Rega rega doon doon, Saskamatash. Let's have music for Heroic Flash. Krillier, 
Flash's friend has called a meeting of the people on Venus for the purpose of selecting a new leader and a new government, now that Stang has been overcome. Stang, by his secret message, sends one of his henchmen, the evil scale man, Karga, to block the election of Krillir, who is the leading candidate. However, when the balloting is over, Karga is defeated, and Krillir has been elected. Suddenly, Stang himself appears on the scene and whips his followers into a frenzied attempt to seize power. Stang's first target is his old nemesis, Flash Gordon. He lets go at Flash with his ray gun. But in the excitement of the attack, Stang's blast misses its mark. At last picture top row, Flash is able to make his way to the electron beam controls. Tuning the beam on the rioters, he temporarily paralyzes their nerve center. When Flash checks up on the unconscious rebels, he's dismayed to find that somehow both Stang and Kaga have escaped. Dashing to a window, he is just in time to see the two ringleaders blast off in a jet flyer they have seized. Rillier leaps to the palace guns and fires wildly. But Flash calls a halt. No, no, it's no use. They're out of range. Look, I'll follow Stang and Kaga. You're needed here. The rebels are soon to regain consciousness. Ten minutes later. Flash and Dale speed in pursuit of the fleeing tyrant and his henchmen. Flash says, they're certain to head for the scale man's caverns inside the planet. Our job is to follow them. It's dangerous, but we have no choice. Dale was right. Flash shouldn't have trusted King Stang. She told him. Remember last? She told yes, him. That's right. She said her woman's intuition warned her not to trust Dang. Yes, her woman's tuition. That's a feeling that a woman has, and Flash should have trusted Dale's tuition. And now look at the trouble he's in. Well, after all... He should have listened to her. She's a woman, and her tuition was right. But would he listen? No. Yes, but after all, you... Man, they just don't pay any attention to a woman when she's right. Yes, but you must... Now re... what'll happen to him? Would you like to read Donald Duck? He's right across the page. Oh, yes, my favorite, favorite, Donald Duck. Fine. And here we go with your favorite, favorite, Donald Duck. Say the magic words with me. Squeeze them, squeeze them, squiddy chick a chat. Let's have music to fit a quack quack. Donald and his girlfriend, Daisy, are out for a drive in the country. Donald isn't quite sure where he is, so he says to Daisy, Ah. You mind handing me the map in the glove compartment? Daisy replies, Well, you don't need it. I've been over this road, and I never forget. Well, okay. Daisy points ahead and says, third picture, top row. Past that tree there, there'll be a... Ah, yes, turn right. Now, this is the grade I told you was coming. Apex Mountain, it's called. And by the time you get to the last picture, top row, Daisy is saying, Now, around the next turn's a bridge. We go a mile beyond. Second picture, bottom row, they're making another turn. The road's not so good from here as I remember it. We come to a gate. Uh, or was it a bridge? Oh, no, no. It was a, tu- a tunnel? Hmm. Uh, maybe I better look at that. And last picture. The car stands up to its hubs in a pig pen at the end of the road. Donald turns to Daisy disgustedly. Okay. Now, let's have the map. <laughs> What was that you were saying a while ago about women always being right? Well, this is different. And why is it different? Because with Dale, it was her tuition. But with Daisy, it was her memory. And? You can always trust a woman's tuition, but her memory, well, well, that's just a different thing. Oh, it is? Why? Because her tuition is something, well, it's just there when you're born. But your memory, well, what's in your memory is what you've learned. So, So there, you can make a mistake. Oh, I see. You can trust a woman's intuition, but not her memory. Yes. Well, what do you do about a woman's memory? You just uh, excuse.
use it. Oh, I see. Well, thank you very much for the lesson. You're welcome. Now, can we please read Peter Pan? Yes, I'd be delighted to. Let's turn over the page. And oh, look, there on page seven is Peter Pan. Mm -hmm. Remember, last week you said that today we might see Captain Hook. That's right, I did promise you. Well, there's nothing wrong with your memory. No, there isn't. Well, today we certainly will find... Then please, quick read. All right, here we go with Peter Pan. Pirates, crocodiles, Peter Pie Pan. Whisk up music for Never Never Land. Peter Pan, the little man from Never Never Land, came back to the darling household, found his shadow, and has taught the three darling children how to fly. And now they're on their way toward Neverland. Now let's look ahead. Ah, there's a big pirate ship, and on the deck is the elegant Captain Hook, the world's most famous crook. He's named Captain Hook because one arm was bitten off by a crocodile. And now, where once there was a hand with five fingers, there is one steel hook. The captain is studying a map, trying to figure out where Peter Pan maintains his hideout. He peers at the map and snarls, No oh, blush, Peter Pan! And then he hears... Oh, Smee! Smee! What's that, Smee? Smee, the captain's man, runs to the railing and looks over. He sees a crocodile stick its head up out of the water, looking for Captain Hook. Well, 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 I do believe it is a crocodile, Captain. Oh, no, 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 not the crocodile. Chase him away, Smee, chase him away. Last picture, top row, Smee shouts down at the crocodile. Hey, shame on you, upsetting the poor captain. Shoo, shoo. And the crocodile disappears under the water. First picture, bottom row, Hook snarls. Oh, that cursed beast. Ever since Peter Pan fed him my hand, he's been hungry for the rest of me. Yes, then he'd have had you by now, Captain, if he hadn't swallowed that alarm clock. When he's about, he warns you with his tick-tock. Oh, blast Peter Pan. If only I could find his hideout. At that moment, the lookout shouts. Peter Pan, ahoy! A grin appears on Hook's face. Watch, where are we? Three points off the starboard. Last picture, Hook whips out a spyglass, looks to the heavens and exclaims, Swaggle me eyes. It is Pan. We've got him this time, Smith. Oh, isn't that Captain Hook ferocious? That he is. What will he try to do? Shoot Peter Pan down out of the sky? I'll bet you that's what he tries. Oh, and the three darling children are flying around overhead, too. I hope he doesn't shoot them. Well, I don't think he will. Next week, we'll see what really happens. But now it's time for Dagwood and Blondie. Oh, and I know where we'll find them. In the first page of the second section. Well, you get that spread out, and I'll read Dagwood and Blondie in just a moment. But first, here's that nice man again with something interesting to say. Now here we go again with Puck the Comic Weekly. And on the first page of the second section, Dagwood and Blondie. Magic words for the music, please. Very well, my lady. Ramafu, Ramafum, Zim, Zam, Zombie. Conjure me music for Dagwood and Blondie. The doorbell rings at the Bumstead house. Dagwood goes to open the door. He shouts, Oh, Blondie! There's a man here from the photographers. Blondie trots to the door. Oh, oh, my goodness, I forgot. This is the day we're to have the family group picture taken. Last picture, top row, the photographer is setting up his equipment. Blondie comes in leading Cookie. Dagwood, I found Cookie. Now you rush out and find Alexander, quick. First picture, second row, Dagwood dashes down the street. Screaming at the top of his voice, Alexander! 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 Ten minutes later, Dagwood comes in the house. All right, I found Alexander. Now, where's... Hey, where's Blondie? And the photographer answers. Oh, uh, she went out uh, looking for you. And out the door, Dagwood and Alexander go. Blondie! 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 
Last picture, second row. Alexander shouts, Hey, there they are, Pop! Dagwood, catch the pups. I want them in the picture, too. And Dagwood runs off in six different directions. First picture, third row, trying to catch the pups. Hey, come back! Come back! Hey, please, please, pretty please, with a dog biscuit on it! A half hour later, Dagwood comes into the house carrying all the dogs. Blondie meets him at the door. Come, dear. The photographer has his camera all set up and ready. And ten minutes later, the whole family, Blondie, Dagwood, Cookie, Alexander, and the six dogs, uh, no, the five dogs, no, the six dogs, are all lined up before the photographer. All right, hold it now. Everybody smile. Everybody smiles. And then the picture is taken. And first picture, bottom row, away rush the dogs and the children. Hey, thank goodness that's over. Yeah, now we can get back to our games. Suddenly, the photographer looks at his camera. Oh, silly me. I forgot to take the lens cap off my camera. We'll have to take it all over again. And Dagwood goes, What? <laughs> And last picture, down the street come two streaks. It's the photographer with Dagwood after him, brandishing the camera. Please stand still a minute. I just want to take your picture. Oh, I don't blame Dagwood for being mad after all that trouble. I don't either. If Dagwood takes that photographer's picture with that camera, it'll be a bloody one, I'm afraid. Yes, it's so funny the way that photographer's running with Dagwood after him. Yes, it is. Well, now let's turn over the page and see who's there. Oh, look, there's Dick's adventure. Oh, yes, and Dick is in the midst of a very interesting adventure because he's in the early days of America in the city of New Orleans at a time when the Americans and the British are at war. And Dick and a friend of his, that's the major in the army, were captured by the pirate Jean Lafitte. Yes, Lafitte has taken Dick and his friend the major through the swamps and bayous to the pirate stronghold, a city at the edge of Barataria Bay. And the captain of the pirates, Jean Lafitte, has told Dick that the British are coming to meet Lafitte that, that evening. Yes, you see, the British have offered Lafitte 30,000 pounds of English money if Lafitte will help the British fight the Americans. And this is to be discussed at that meeting. Well, I wonder why Lafitte has asked Dick to come to this particular party. Well, let's read now and find out. Here we go with Dick's adventures. Say the magic words with me. riggedy pack a zack a zick That's some music for adventurous Dick. Meeting with the British turns out to be a banquet given by Lafitte in honor of the British. Dick sees the British bring in a huge chest and set it down. Lafitte whispers to Dick, Keep your ears open. Last picture top row, Dick, whom the British think is Lafitte's friend, hears the British tell Lafitte of their plans to attack New Orleans. Then the chest is opened. And Dick sees it's filled with gold doubloons. The British offer this to Lafitte as a reward if he will help the British with his men and ships in the attack against the Americans. First picture, second row. Before the banquet ends, Dick sees his chance to escape. General Jackson must be warned of the impending attack. Dick slips out the banquet hall, makes his way to the prison, and in a quick surprise, knocks out the guard. To get the major out. And Dick unlocks the cell, releasing Major Villain. Last picture, third row, the major and Dick race toward a point of the bayou where Lafitte's boats are moored. First picture, bottom row, the guard comes to and shouts the alarm. Help! Help! The prisoner has escaped! <laughs> the pirates quickly spread out on a search. Dick and the Major, last picture, push away from shore in a boat and head for the swamps. Dick says, They'll be after us in a minute, Major. Gosh, I hope we don't get lost in all these channels. Oh, my goodness. I hope that Dick can get to General Jackson and warn him in time. Well, he can only do it if the Major and he can keep away from those pirates. Yes, but that's not going to be easy because... Those pirates know all those swamps very well, and Dick doesn't know them at all. 
Do you think that you will ever get away safely? Well, I'm afraid we'll have to wait until next week to find that out. But now look below Dick's adventures. There's Rusty Riley. And we can find out some things about him right now if you're interested. Oh, you know I'm interested because I just love Rusty and he's in trouble. Oh, yes, he is. He's run away and joined a carnival where he's been hired by two men who are crooks. Rusty overheard the crooks plotting something bad against Mr. Dooley. Mr. Dooley is the owner of the carnival. Yes, and then he found a cuff button in the shack where he had overheard the crooks in the first place. And then one of the men who had hired Rusty for this job told Rusty that he'd lost the cuff button. I wonder if that'll make Rusty know that this is one of the men that he'd heard there in the dark. Well, let's read now and find out. Here we go with Rusty Riley. Gallop and run till the road is dusty. Give us music for his horse and Rusty. Back at Milestone Farm, Tex is talking to Mr. Miles. Uh, let's have the facts about Rusty Tex. He wrote me saying he had to leave Milestone Farm because of his no-good uncle. That this uh, uncle of his, Rufus, was out of jail. Yes, that's right, boss. That ornery coyote threatened to put him back in the orphan's home unless he put the bite on you for a lot of money. I think it must have nigh busted Rusty's heart to leave Milestone Farm... But he'd do anything to keep from making trouble for you. Third picture, top row, Mr. Miles shakes his head. Oh, poor lad. I couldn't love him more if he were my own. Where do you think he is, Tex? Well, boss, I kind of figured he went with a carnival that was playing where we was. But the carnival boss hasn't seen him. <laughs> Last picture, top row. At that moment in the town near the carnival, Rusty and his friend, Mr. Stovepipe, have found lodgings. Well, well, my boy. We're all set in comfortable lodgings. And you are launched upon your career as assistant to the great necro, the magician. Ah, oh, but my boy, you seem worried. Oh, yes, I am, Mr. Stovepipe. Last night when I slept in that shack near the carnival, well, I heard two men planning to do some kind of harm to Mr. Dooley, the owner of the show. Stovepipe goes on, first picture, bottom row. If uh, my memory serves me rightly, you didn't see the men. All you know, my boy, is that there are new act with the carne, and there are six or eight new acts. Yes, but Mr. Stovepipe, when I went to that shack to get my suitcase today, I found a man's cufflink on the floor, and, and, and just now, Mr. Necro gave me a dollar, and, and he asked me to buy him some cufflinks because he'd lost one of his. Well, well, I see. Looks like he was one of the men you ever heard in that shack. What should I do, Mr. Stovepipe? Sh should I take the job as assistant in his magic act? As I said, my boy, it looks like he was in the shack. That's not proof. Yes, I'd say take the job and keep your eyes open. <laughs> Meanwhile, last picture, in the great Necro's dressing room at the carnival, his companion in crime is talking with him. Hey, listen, Specs, I'm jittery about cracking Dooley safe with our wreckage if anything went wrong. The great Necro, who is really Specs, replies, But I have no intention of doing anything so crude as cracking a safe. I intend to exploit a certain weakness of Dooley's to take him to the cleaners. And don't call me Specs. <laughs> He really does suspect then that Mr. Necro is a crook. Yes, he does. But I wonder why Stovepipe wants Rusty to keep his job working with the crook. Well, to keep his eyes open and to watch and see what happens. Oh. Oh, well, maybe Rusty will find out what the crooks are up to, and he'll be able to stop them from doing anything bad to Mr. Dooley, and he'll become a hero. That could happen, and we'll find that out as time goes along. But now look across the page. There's Roy Rogers on page four. Yes, and Roy Rogers and his friend Dolfo Hawkins had come to Pine City to talk to Dolfo Hawkins' boss. And when they walked into the office, they found Dolfo's boss on the floor dead. And we saw those two crooks named Creaky and Bullwhip coming out of the back door of the building. And I am very sure that they're the ones that killed him. And I'm sure you're right. And Dolfo Hawkins' nephew, Tim, saw them come out, too, when he began to throw rocks at him. I wonder him. what'll happen next. Well, let's read now and find out. Here we go with Roy Rogers, King of the Cowboys. A yip by yo now here we go with Roy and Trigger. A yip by yo The 
Boy Tim starts throwing rocks at the two outlaws. Bullwhip growls, Hey, grab that kid, Creaky. If he blabs he saw us sneaking out of the Bratton freight office, we're sunk. Quickly, Creaky grabs little Tim, who begins to kick and fight. Hey, let me go, will you? Let me go. The outlaws mount up and ride for the hills. <laughs> Meanwhile, last picture top row, Doleful and Roy come out of the office. Doleful says, Whoever killed my boss, Hank Bratton, made a clean getaway, Roy. Hey, where's Tim, my pesky nephew? Why, he said he's out here playing Indian. First picture bottom row, a man comes out of the telegraph office. Hey, uh, this came for you from the Tomahawk Mine, Doleful. I want you up there to investigate some trouble. Huh? I suppose Fancy Farrell's freight outfit is trying to horn in on our ore hauling contract again. All is some kind of trouble brewing. Roy answers, second picture bottom row. Well, you go on ahead, Doleful. I'll fetch the sheriff and help him round up Bratton's killer. Okay, then. You find Tim and keep him out of mischief while I get back too, Roy. Roy goes around behind the building. And there, he finds Tim Slingshot and tracks in the dust. Well, Tim Slingshot and also tracks of two hombres. One with new boots. That could be fancy Farrow's man, Creaky and Bullwhip. Meanwhile, last picture, Fancy Farrow, leader of the outlaws, rides to meet his men at their hideout. All right, let's go, horse. I gotta tell the boys about Decoy and Hawkins to the mine with a phony message. When they bushwhack him, the Bratton line is finished. Oh, and now the outlaws have the boy, and that message to Doleful was just a trick to separate him from Roy. Yes, they're planning on putting Doleful out of the way so Fancy Farrow and his gang can get control of all business connected with hauling the ore. Well, I wonder whether Roy will be able to trail those men and help Doleful and save Tim. Well, that's something we'll have to wait until next week to find out. Now, that's all the time I have, but before I go, here's that nice fellow again with some more interesting information. Well, honey, and all you boys and girls, I gotta go now. All right, Mr. Comic Weekly Man, but I'll be waiting for you next week. Okay, that's a date, and a date with all you boys and girls. Be sure to meet me with our little friend, Miss Honey, next week when I read Puck the Comic Weekly. For I'm the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man. I'll be back to read the funnies to you happy boys and honeys. Don't forget, boys and girls, see you all next week. Your friend, the Comic Weekly Man... The Jolly Comic Weekly Man.